Good morning. And a blessed Reformation Day. Sometimes we say Reformation Sunday. Today is actually the day. Uh, November 1st was a day of obligation for good Christians everywhere in the Western world when a monk named Martin Luther, a faithful monk, uh, chose to question uh, the purchase of indulgence uh, for uh, putting away sin. Uh, those 95 theses, which he wrote and nailed on the door on October 31st so that everyone coming into church the next day would see them, um, are actually posted in English on our secretary's door uh, for your um, edification. And uh, also, um, they were written in Latin, by the way, because it was intended by Luther that there would be a scholarly discussion of things in question, but that the normal church folk who spoke German would not have their consciences and souls troubled by something that simply needed to be solved within the church by those appointed to do so. Uh, we also recognize that it's um, Halloween for other reasons, and uh, I see everyone's worn their masks, and so um, <laughs> a few things by way of announcement. Uh, two sons of our congregation have become Lutheran pastors in the Missouri Synod across the time, a third in a smaller Lutheran denomination, and uh, we uh, consider today, or remember today, Pastor Wally Shiflett, uh, who is finishing up a uh, stint at Nazareth Lutheran Church in Hopewell, Virginia. Uh, at one time he had retired, I talked with him yesterday, but at, from Abundant Life Church in Charlotte, and thought he was retired, and then not only came back to serve up in Hopewell, but was eventually called there, so he retires again. There's some who may wish to send him a, um, uh, a card of congratulations, and our bulletin was chock full, and this came into us after much of this had been put in, we have some address forms here, and it's, if anybody wishes to take an address, George Bresnick is standing in the back, ready to hand you one in your pew right now, custom delivery, anybody. Okay, friends, we will have these waiting uh, out, especially for you upstairs as well, out uh, at the exit line as well, and uh, if you wish to uh, communicate in that way, you'll have it right at hand. Thanksgiving comes up and is our wonderful opportunity to be a witness in the neighborhood as well as to supply human need. And uh, for those who are unable to afford a Thanksgiving dinner, we do make up baskets. Uh, Ronnie Bresnick is here and uh, we are happy that she is taking sign up for uh, those within our congregation who may have that need or who may know someone uh, and like to sponsor them. We say that you can sponsor one other family besides your own. And uh, this is all, this is the final day, October 31st, of church only priority. Starting tomorrow, it becomes much more rough and tumble. And uh, look, if you are here today, okay, you may sign up with Ronnie. You don't have to have, some are maybe visiting or whatever. If you're here, you can sign up with her today and have priority. However, Tomorrow is rough and tumble at 9 a.m. when the calls start coming in. Cricket will put them on. She will fill the list. Good members, if they haven't signed up, may be left off. But we can't help it. This is our third Sunday doing this, so we hope everyone will understand. Uh, so you know your job now. The other thing is, in collecting for the food, uh, the Market Basket survey shows uh, anywhere from 40 to 70 percent increase from last year to this year in the cost of Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, we are very blessed that a group of uh, our members and friends uh, have, if you've seen cans on the table in the fellowship hall, have probably reduced the cost by those items being given uh, to about what it was last year, which is somewhere around 22 or $23 a basket, we think, to put a decent meal together, a generous meal together, frankly. And so next week and the week after, we're going to do what we're calling two and done, um, we will receive donations. Um, we are looking for a monetary donation, if you would, and, uh, and we thank you. If you do have items to bring in, please make me aware of that, and we will plan for that when we go buying with the monetary gifts that come in. But November 7th and 14th, and we'll have an amount figured, and we will ask, but we think it would be about $22 or $23 a meal. Um, Today in the worship, our offertory, when we usually, after the sermon, we sing Create in Me, and we call it the offertory because we're offering our whole selves. Well, today, in keeping with the theme of the Reformation, we're saving the fifth verse of our sermon hymn. We'll sing four before the sermon, and the fifth verse is a verse of giving ourselves to the Lord, and so we will actually use that hymn, as you see uh, denoted on the hymn uh, board. 
Welcome back to our uh, people who are worshiping by streaming. Uh, we are glad to be in person. We appreciate whenever it's possible to gather in person. We know that there are some reasons why people have to stream, and we're so pleased that you picked us uh, for worship, that we may worship the Lord together. We also appreciate your patience last week uh, when things uh, decided to quit unceremoniously somewhere before the sermon. Uh, we were told uh, the video and then ultimately the audio as well. And uh, so what happens is we quickly sought to have it repaired. We're glad you're back and stuck with us. Uh, we had a simple bad plug in the power strip. So a new power strip's coming, folks. Um, and then finally, uh, over at St. Thomas Lutheran Church, they're in a hard scrabble area of Baltimore and Carrollton Ridge. And uh, we welcome uh, some listeners from St. Thomas as well. And uh, they are having their free turkey dinner on Thanksgiving, as they have had for over 40 years. And uh, we are hoping that for Martini, we might find four families, uh, four people, who would be willing to cook a turkey um, that will be supplied for you and uh, cook it and uh, make it ready for, I will pick it up from you uh, the day before or the day of if necessary and, uh, and use that for the carving of meat that we will do to feed people that day of Thanksgiving in Carrollton Ridge. Um, so if we have four people, and I'm going to do something a touch risky here, um, and this is not what you give for it, this is well, your cook a turkey that we give you. Um, is there anybody who's willing to be one of four cooks that we need? One, two, three, four. Thank you in the balcony. It looks like they all sat together. They just knew they were coming to do that. God bless you. Um, I'll write down your names today. If anything comes up, let me know, but we'll let you know how it works. And we are excited for that. Friends, finally, those are the messages and announcements that I have. Everything else is in the bulletin. We need to worship our Lord this Reformation Day, and we begin in a great way with him. 656, a mighty fortress is our God.
the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he has given power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. To the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have...
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. We are seated for the reading of our catechism. Our catechism is the seventh petition, and so we ask, what is the seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer? What does this mean? We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation. And finally, when our last hour comes, Give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. Our first reading for the day of the Reformation from the 14th chapter of Revelation, beginning at the sixth verse. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The word of the Lord.
Our second reading forms the basis of our sermon today. From the third chapter of Romans, beginning at the 19th verse, St. Paul writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The word of the Lord. Gospel from the 8th chapter of John, beginning at the 31st verse. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you may be seated as we invite our boys and girls forward for a children's talk. Good morning, and good morning, thank you. As you see, the colors have changed. I'm wearing red because here on Reformation Day, it's a celebration. And you'll see that on our altarpiece, as well as on my stole, we have the dove of the Holy Spirit. Because when there's celebration in the church, the Holy Spirit always has something to do with it because he's making us glad and happy in something about Jesus, and Jesus works through God's people. Today we call it Reformation Day. That's a long word. Can you guys say Reformation? 
Reformation. That's right. I see, I see our youngest ones are also dressed up, reminding us that it's what other day today? It's Halloween, right? Well, I didn't bring candy, but I brought some things that I thought you might like. I'm going to ask our acolytes to help out here. Can you take this over to Ava, if you will? I'll give you one as well. I'll give you one. There's stickers. Now, I don't want you to peel them off at this time. I don't want you to stick them anything until after you've gone home, okay? And then when you stick them somewhere, I want you to make sure with your mom or dad that it's okay wherever it is you're going to stick them. But uh, we talk about a guy named Martin Luther, who was a reformer over 500 years ago. And he made this up, and he says, this represents me. So we're going to take a look at what we have here. What's in the very, very center is a cross because Jesus is central and he took all our sins upon him. And then what's next? What's the cross found in? Our heart. And we remember the scripture which says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we remember how he is the one who has changed our heart through the waters of baptism, through the power of his word that we are believers in him and that we hold him central in our hearts and we love him. And also then, because you see he's taken all the sin to himself, our hearts are free to go and love others. Then this next thing may be hard to know what it is, but Dr. Luther meant for it to be a rose, okay? It's sort of a stylized rose. And what happens is he, he made it the same color as the robes that we are told about the Christians wearing in heaven, but he says, in a sense, it's like heaven on earth. There's such joy in belonging to Jesus and wearing his robe of righteousness that we are happy and we're able to serve him in everything we do. Then finally, there's the blue sky. And while blue is a color of faithfulness, he said, I just want you to look at the sky and think, God has prepared and is preparing a wonderful place in heaven for me. And so we see the blue. And then what is the final color on the very border? It's hard to tell. It's, would you, what, what is it, do you know? It's gold, right? It's gold. Where are the streets paved with gold? In heaven. And not only that, but gold is very precious. And so we are saying that all that God does is most precious for us, both for now and for eternity. All this because when Dr. Luther said this spoke about me, meaning himself, it speaks about us too. It all started with the cross. Without the cross, no heaven. Without the cross, no life that's happy and free. As we just heard in the scriptures, Jesus saying, I'm setting you free from sin and from troubles. And so you're free indeed. No way that our hearts can be true without Jesus' cross. And so it all goes back to Jesus and his great love for us when he died for us and that he is our savior. Now, we celebrate Jesus. I have a toy for you that you can take home. And we do, glad, I told your folks, and you, are, you are wonderful to be always here with your daughter, Chris. And uh, there's some small pieces in here. It's rated for age four, but there are some small pieces. If she wants to come over, she can, Ava. Here you go, this is for you. Okay, wait till you're home before you open it. That's probably not going to happen. Okay, and that is for you, Dakota. Hope you enjoy that. It's all yours. You get one, too. You get one, too. You get one, too. I've got boxes of them. But friends, happy Reformation Day. And we enjoy that it's all about our Lord Jesus. You go back to your seat. We'll continue singing. Okay, will you take this? Put it where you found it. Other place.
peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is uh, actually the entire reading, but we especially uh, hear these words from uh, verse 20, uh, 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And here ends the reading of our text. Friends, you may be seated, and uh, we, we continue in our uh, preaching here from Romans. Uh, we understand that St. Paul is making the case for Jesus Christ. And he's making the case for Jesus Christ in a clear way that shows that all creation testifies of him when we start in chapter 1, and also that all the prophets attest to him uh, through these chapters. There is in living our lives uh, that which uh, the Bible deals with and which, frankly, this Reformation Day, uh, Dr. Luther dealt with. And there is what is known as saving faith and living faith when we talk about our faith. Yes, it's true, you have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith must always be in something or someone. Faith can't just be general, oh, I have faith, because if it's not anchored in something, there is no power to that faith. But faith becomes great when it's anchored in one who is great. And so Christ, in humbling himself, was then exalted by God. Your faith could not be in one greater. But saving faith is what we mean when we talk about, the big word is justification. Justification is when God declares you righteous. So when you think justify, you want to think declare righteous. And because it's Reformation Sunday, and I want to make sure we get this, this is, the, this is not a Lutheran term, this is a biblical term, it's not a Lutheran definition, it is a biblical definition. But then again, we make this uh, promise that if we call something Lutheran, it will be biblical. And my goodness, if it's biblical, we will teach and preach it. So when I say justify, then what you want to say is declare righteous. So justify. And if I say justified in the past tense, you would say declared righteous. Okay. So we're going to try this again. We're going to be spontaneous. Justify. Justified. Okay. I want you to get that in your mind because we always have things that we want to adjust. Now you'll have to say it this time. That we all want to justify is you have to justify your tax deductions. You have to justify uh, something you say if someone says, I doubt that's true. And there are many ways of justifying. Sometimes you justify your love by indeed doing works. And so we have saving faith and living faith. And to be justified, to have saving faith is a positional thing. You are now a child of God. You were declared righteous even though you all have already ticked your hand, tipped your hand that you aren't since you were confessing your sins this morning. How righteous is that when every week you have to come and you have this pile of sins to dump out for Christ to sweep away and cleanse away by his blood? But saving faith is about your standing. Who are you before God? And he looks at you and he loves you as a redeemed child of God. You are justified. You are declared righteous. And then there's what we might call living faith. It's part of faith. And living faith is, so what do I do today? How do I think? How do I act? What will I do today? How will I approach things when things are easy? Will the ease of things make me lazy spiritually? Or will they make me thankful and cause me to be a better steward because I have better stuff to work with? Or how will the paucity of things be? And will it make me someone who becomes bitter that I don't have? Or will it be a reason to aspire and to plead to God and to seek things that we might use them to his glory? Living faith will deal with the devil tempting you through want and through much. He will tempt you through that which is good to make you pompous and hypocritical. He will tempt you through that which is bad to make you outright sin in a way that you'll recognize very easily. And so living faith is the idea of putting saving faith into practice. It's part of the place where you're the battlefield and where there will be days when you do better than others. It's just the way it is. And so justify is position, declare righteous. That's what God has done for you and he looks upon you that way. When you stand before him in prayer and say, I come to you in Jesus' name, you're saying, I'm coming to you as one who is bought by the blood of Jesus. He or declared righteous. He looks upon you in that way. 
when you come into prayer as in confessing sins, you're telling him about your living faith. In some ways, Lord, it's gone well. I have many reasons to thank you. But here are some ways it didn't go well. And the reason is not you, Lord. It's me. Well, I'd like to do something as we preach the Reformation, but we are really preaching this scripture. And so I'd like to simply teach through these words, the word of God, starting with the 19th verse. Look at the back of your bulletin. You can open your Bibles if you wish. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. That makes sense. If the law is written, there's a law for Maryland. If you live in Maryland, it's speaking to us who live in Maryland. It's a Maryland law. If it's a city law, same thing, or a national law. There are certain things which are laws of nature, things like gravity. I don't know, it doesn't matter what country you go to, you drop something, it hits the ground. There is the law of two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So if you disobey the law of the stop sign, you might find that cars crash because two items cannot, two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. These are laws of physics then. And so you are under all kinds of law. The scripture says, well, you're under God's law as well. And the law can mean each of the set of laws or it can deal with sort of an economy or a way things work. And you'll hear the word law used in this passage both ways. So whatever it says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. <clears throat> Friends, you travel a little more south of Maryland and you will hear people sometimes say, well, shut my mouth. And you'll say, hmm, wonder what that's about. And uh, as you listen, you find maybe they were talking and giving their opinion on something, and someone else in the conversation gave a salient point which completely changes the basis of which they're talking, and they realize they were misinformed. They might say, well, shut my mouth. I had no idea that it happened. On the other hand, you could be at dinner. Maybe it's Thanksgiving dinner, and since we're going a little further south, we're going to have some delicious cornbread sitting on the table. And it could be that someone's talking away and they take a bite of the cornbread and they say, well, shut my mouth. This is the best cornbread that I could ever have. It means that something's happened that's changed the situation and the speech stops of what was said and something else is going to be said. And the fact of the matter is, here's what happens when God's law comes. We read that we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. The idea is that when people try to be right before God and look at every other religion in the world outside of the religion of Jesus Christ, the religion pointing forward to him of the Jewish people and springing from him of those who believe him, the Messiah, the Christian church. And you take a look and you see this and every other religion is looking to extol the works of man. Every other religion is looking to have a teaching of someone enlightened or to honor the ancestors or to have a deity they have made up that requires certain things each day. And so whatever it is, you could be busy saying, well, I know I'm a good and then fill in your religion and say because and then you name the ancestors you're pleasing, the enlightened teacher you're following or the recipe that this God that is not the Lord has given you and you name these things well I'm praying this many times a day or I'm being gentle to people as my ancestor so and so was or whatever the case and then the law of God comes and shows us all to be sinners in thought, word or deed and we all say well shut my mouth Anything we would say to put ourselves forward, to vaunt ourselves as being the best people, most likable to God in the world, suddenly stops when we understand that the law of God has accused us all, and successfully so. That's why we kneel before God. Our mouths are stopped in our own self-praise. And so when we hear this, it says, every mouth be stopped and the whole world be accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Sure enough, knowledge of sin comes, and all at once, I can say all the good things about me that I want to speak of how good God and I are. And then what happens is God's law reminds me, not good enough. Not up to the standard of the true holiness of God. What happens then? My mouth is stopped. Every mouth, we are told, is stopped. And the whole world, including me, is held accountable to God. Just take me through the simplicity of the Ten Commandments. I'll find where I have not kept them. 
maybe I say, well, I haven't killed anybody. But when we talk about thought, word, and deed, we realize that when the scripture says, he that hates his brother is a murderer, why does everyone say, well, I hate him. I don't really hate him. Because they don't want to be seen as breaking that commandment. But they've just said they do. And the fact of the matter is, in thought, word, or deed, every one of us stands guilty of every commandment. And not only then, then James helps us a lot. He says, to him who knows good and does it not, to him it is sin. So now it's not just don't do the bad stuff, but if you know the good and you didn't do it, you're wrong there too. That's why every mouth is stopped. Every mouth. And then we hear this, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested as shown forth apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So since we found out we were hopeless, any time we would live by an inspired teacher, by being good to our ancestry and our legacy, uh, by following any God that people make up, and oftentimes we're making things up about who God is and what he'll do. I'm amazed at the people who tell me they have a deal with God, and the deal looks like something the Bible never heard of or maybe is against, but somehow they've got a deal with God. And so what ends up happening is every mouth is stopped. Every mouth is stopped because through the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. So if when someone asks you about how you're doing with the Lord, if you start telling them how good you are, somewhere the law is going to come and shut your mouth. It simply is the way it works. But that means you're hopeless. There is no hope to be right with God. If you can't do anything that will be righteous in his sight, your goose is cooked. It's over. Stick a fork in you. You're going to roast for the rest of eternity. But, says verse 21, but. You know, if our, if our reading is started with the word but, you know I love these. It's like red meat. You want to know what came before? What came before is you, there's no hope for you. No matter what you try to do, you're guilty before God. But now the righteousness of God has been shown, has been manifested apart from the law. Well, good, because through the law, the law it wasn't working, so there's something else. Not only that, this very law which has been accusing me and holding me up and showing me guilty has actually been testifying. It says the law and the prophets bear witness to this righteousness apart from the law. Well, I want to know that because since there's no way with me and the law, I want to find out if there is a way, maybe there's still hope for me. And what is this they bear witness to? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That is what we call the alien righteousness of God. Every Reformation, a few other times, I pull out that term. I like the term because it sounds amazing enough to make you stop and think. But it doesn't mean that the UFO landed and suddenly little green men started giving you the righteousness of God. What it did mean is that God himself landed in a manger and began giving you the righteousness of God, his own self. Showed you the way and then gave himself as the price. And so, of course, this is an alien right. It doesn't come from me because my mouth's been stopped and I've been held accountable to God and it isn't pretty. But now this righteousness apart from me, outside of me, not only outside of me, but outside of this world system which crashed and burned with Adam and Eve eating of the fruit of the tree. And we spend our time both improving things, both in health and in technology, and with so many good things for humankind and in the arts and other ways. And we also spend our time wrecking it. However equally good there is, there is at least equally bad. And so we find ourselves in danger in want with people suffering with violence. And we realize something needs to come from outside of ourselves because we haven't solved this in all these thousands of years. And so it must be something alien, something from a different world and from the world of heaven and of God's mind and heart for you, a righteousness has come. And then he says, for there is no distinction. Distinction between whom? Distinction from what to what? Well, St. Paul's writing could be Jews and Gentiles. I'm sure it is. There was always the sense of the Jews to whom he's writing, that they have the way already, and the Gentiles are a bunch of ignorant pagans. But then the Jews were all caught up in many ways in almost the same corruption that was there at Jesus' time, and in trying to add on to the message of a simple sacrifice for our sins, like the lamb that was brought on the day of salvation or atonement, Yom Kippur. They always wanted to do more than that. 
And so they had built up a lot of do's and don'ts, which sound a lot like the law, sometimes God's law, sometimes man's law, both of them unattainable, by the way. And so then the Gentiles, what of them? Well, they were worshiping gods where a person would take a piece of wood, stone, or metal that he owned and then use his own creative part of himself on it so as to make it into a beautiful statue. And then instead of staying the master of it, he would suddenly bow down and ask it what to do for his future, if not for his eternity. So that wasn't working well either. And so there is no distinction. Where there's no distinction is among every mouth that's been stopped by the law. Where there is no distinction is among everyone in the world who's been held accountable to God. This is universal. There is no distinction. For all have, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now, some of you know Romans 3.23 is a proof text to remind people they're sinners. Well, you know the Bible has said all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, it really doesn't say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even though it's the idea that we get that we should make those verbs agree. But the scripture is inspired to have the verbs not agree. Sinned does not go with the word fallen. Sin is put with the word fall. And that's very important to your faith. All have sinned. Yes, you've done things. Yes, you've done things. But then it says, and fall short of the glory of God. Because the problem is not only have we done things, but we keep falling. Fall is in the present tense. And in, in Greek, that's known as present continuous action. We keep on falling. Today, we can say, I sinned. But if we agree with the scriptures, today we say, I fall short. That's who I am now. And that's me talking about my living faith. My saving faith says, I am positioned as the child of God. whom God has declared righteous. But daily, I fall short of the glory of God. And there's more that we are. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we look and we say, well, pastor, how can this be the whole world? Not everyone has been justified as a free gift. And the first thing I'll tell you is, yes, they have. They've been paid for. They've been paid for and enough has been placed there before God's altar at a cross which dies for the sins of the world. For the Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The point being, Jesus died and paid for the sins of all people, all time, all over the world so that he would not have to, if they reached a certain limit, come back down and die again. He died for all. But yet all do not believe, and that's why we're told that this is the righteousness received by faith. The righteousness for those who believe. It's there. Every one of you may suddenly have $10 million put in your bank account. But if you never have accessed it from the account, it's yours, but it might as well not be. And in the end, you will live and die as though it isn't because you have never had it in that way. The same way is true with the fact that Jesus died for the whole world. You've maybe heard where we read that the whole world, God passed over sins. And then, what do you make of that? You think, what's he doing? I heard, I thought he had to forgive all sin. He had to, to take action on all sins, to either condemn or to forgive. St. Paul's very clear about this, that for a while God passed over them. And the question is, why did he do that? In his divine forbearance, we're told in uh, verse 25, his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. Well, from Adam to Noah, he passed over sins. From Noah to Abraham, he passed over sins. From Abraham until the very day Jesus was born and to the beginning of his public ministry, he passed over sins. Not at one time did he take any of those people and zap them into a pile of ashes and then instantly send them to eternal hell for their sins. He passed over them for the time being and showed forbearance. But then Jesus came. It was to show his righteousness, says St. Paul, at this present time, meaning the time when Jesus came and died on the cross. He held off, held off, held off, held over, and sprang into action and came in the flesh and died on the cross for those sins. Settled things there on the cross. The battle was done, and the devil, it appeared, won. Because when the battle came and the sins of the world came on him, he was dead. He died. 
But the battle was not over, for the battle continued past death into the eternal kingdoms. And Jesus stood in victory in the middle of hell, having descent to hell, burst forward from a tomb that could not keep him in. For he had truly paid for sins, fully man substituting for you, fully God able to multiply it better than he had ever multiplied loaves and fishes to people. The people believing on him might have their sins forgiven, their souls fed, their salvation won. And so at that time, why would we ever, why would we ever seek to add to this, seek to put back in a need for our works? Why would we ever go back to worshiping the ancestors, enlightened teachers who do not teach the Lord of heaven and earth, or to other gods invented by humans because they had such a need inside and no one had come and told them of the true God. Jesus makes the claim of dying for the world. We only make it because he made it first. Then what becomes of our boasting? You see, we do have a salvation to boast about. We can say, isn't God great? Isn't he wonderful? I had no hope in me. I tried. Goodness knows I tried. But it wasn't working every day. I fall short, but yet it worked. And because it worked, what a great God we have. St. Paul says, is boasting excluded by the law? Uh, No, it's, 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 you shouldn't do it because of the law, because the law economy only, only condemned you. You did what you could and it still didn't work. You can't boast about that. I'm so great, but it didn't work. That's not boasting, is it? He says, no, but by the law of faith. If there's going to be any boasting, the scripture says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so now you have reason to boast and brag on God, to love and tell about Jesus and about the fact that he was that alien righteousness, righteousness that came from outside of you and took care of it all. And he is a 100% savior. For another present continuous action verb tells us, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Do you think of that? In your saving faith, the Lord has wiped the slate clean once for all. But because you're in time and not yet in eternity, as you live from day to day, you sin, you fall short. And while you are busy falling short, the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing from all sins. That should answer your question of what happens if I go to church and hear my forgiveness on Sunday, but wait till Thursday to die. What happens? Will I go to hell for five days? blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us even as we fall. God is by his Holy Spirit raising you back up again. And so at a time when the world was far more uh, ignorant because they were not educated, oftentimes because they were working so hard, there was no time for book learning. At a time when the church became corrupt and there was no check and balance and no other game in town and money became too important, when works were shown as ways of making salvation and the giving of money bought forgiveness for you to get to heaven quicker, it was time to reawaken this, that by all those works of the law, no one would be justified, but by Christ alone would be a full salvation and free. Live in comfort because it is comforting to know that stress is relieved and Christ is all and all as your savior. Live in peace because when you have transgressed God and he should rightfully show his anger, instead Christ took every reason for anger and gave you a relationship called faith and you are at peace. Live in a sense that you're free that there's not one more thing you're making up for. Thank you, Lord, for church, but now I've got to work all week to make up for everything I've done wrong. But that if Jesus, the Son of God, not a slave under God, but the very Son of God, says on behalf of the household, you are free, then you're free. Free to go, free to serve, free to thank, free to live. And so in the doing, we give thanks for this great gospel. We pray, God, that we may not add or subtract from it, but always keep it that Jesus' righteousness is our all in all in saving for eternity and in living each day. Amen. 
The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 5. Sorry. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that for this moment, for this prayer, we do not need to pile up good things we've done and hope that you won't judge us for the bad. But instead, we simply come saying, you sent us a Savior. And we thank you that not only do you care for us in our eternity, but you care for us in each chapter of our living faith. Bless, dear Lord, your people who are in any need. We celebrate the birthday of Katrina Harris, and we ask your blessing upon her in each way. Be, we pray also with Maggie and Dylan upon the birth of Fiona Iris Bradford. Thank you, O Lord, for hearing the prayers of your people as John O'Neill is home from rehab. We love to praise and give you thanks you do all things well. We ask your blessing on those who are homebound and ask that you would continue to help them through each day as faithfully you have done. Be with the sick, uh, Mel, Ronnie, Harriet, Doug, Krista, John, Denise, Peter, Emmett, Scott, Anita, and Jane. And be also, dear Lord, with those who need help in other areas, Mary and the Bell family, Anthony, Mitchell, Francis. We ask, O oh Lord, that in all of these things you would meet each one at their point of need, employ our gifts and abilities which you have given to help that happen for these and for others. 
Lord, in your mercy. Be with and comfort the family of Joanne Reese Niles and point them to your love, to the open arms of your cross, and the powerful emptiness of Jesus' tomb. Lord, in your mercy. Be also, we pray, with uh, Wally and Joanne Shiflett as Wally finishes up another chapter of service and bless them, dear Lord, in this second retirement as they serve you further. Lord, in your mercy. Be with our police, our firefighters, with military and their families, with all who serve and with all who protect. Lord, in your mercy. We rejoice with Deaconess, formerly Deaconess intern Kate Phillips, now serving as a called church worker in Houston, Texas. Be with her and with the people of Memorial Lutheran Church and bless the work you give her to do. Be yet with missionary John Wolfe and his family in Africa. Bless us, O Lord, as we pick yet someone else to support as one has gone forward and is now being supported. And be with your church which is persecuted in Venezuela and in every other part of the world. Release those held in captivity and grant, O Lord, your gospel to change hearts and thereby change countries. Lord, in your mercy. We give you this and all things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Jesus Christ.